Welcome back to another episode of The Conversation. I'm Nubu Ratto. The Conversation, we're bringing different candidates in to talk about different things going on in the city. It's a huge election coming up on September 1st, so we want to educate the city on what's going on in different issues. So we're bringing on different candidates. And it's my honor to bring on a uh, current city councilor. He's running for a state senator. Moses Rodriguez. Moses is a good friend of mine. We go way back. Way back. Way, way, way back. Way back. Um, former mayor, now city council at large. Now you're running for state senator. Um, first and foremost, just th thanks for coming on. Hey, Nubia, thank you very much uh, for having me here, and I, I'm, I'm glad you're doing this new show, you know, called The Conversation. Uh, it's a great uh, way, I think, just to bring in some people in and kind of toss up some ideas and some thoughts. Uh, I hope it has a long life and you continue to do this. Absolutely. Um, so I want people to, you know, I, I think you're a pillar in the city, but, you know, for people who don't know you, talk about, kind of give you history. You, you've been involved um, in politics for a while, you know, on kind of both sides, on the legislative side and, and on the CEO side. Yeah. Just kind of give us, um, you know, for people who don't, who don't know Moses, who yeah. are you? Well, Noob, you know, as you know, I was born in Cape Verde. I grew up in Angola, and I came to Brockton as a teenager back in the 70s. Uh, straight to Brockton High School. Uh, after Brockton High School, I went on to, to college uh, and then joined the uh, military and did some uh, six years in the United States Navy. Uh, by choice. I, I was not drafted. There was no draft back then. I did it because I felt that it was something to do in terms of, uh, of giving something back to the country that actually was, was good to, to us in terms of accommodating us when we first got here. And I, you know, I came here with my parents. You know, we didn't come here illegally. You know, we just basically came through a petition process that my, grand, my, my grandparents had uh, petitioned for my parents to come. Um, and that's how I came to this country. And, I, um, and I've been in the uh, on and off in the city of Brockton for the last 40 years, um, dealing with the uh, with some of the issues that we uh, we have here in the city of Brockton. I think um, you know you have a unique political history. <coughs> um, talk about you know you serve on the city council and then, unfortunately, with the passing of Mayor Carpenter, you had to step in and, and lead the city yeah. uh, unexpectedly for six months. Um, just just talk about that and how that's given you experience mm -hmm. and and how you think that experience is going to help you out in the in the state. Uh, in, the, in the state senate house. Well, even before that, when you go back to 2006, I actually worked with uh, Mayor Harrington in the Harrington administration as one of his uh, people called me top aide or whatever the deal was. But How many jobs did you have over there? I think I was like 17, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, in helping the mayor basically, uh, you know, uh, run the city. So uh, that actually gave me a leg up in terms of knowing what goes on as far as the municipality is concerned. And then I ran in 2000. And 13 and got elected to the city council as an at-large councillor uh, here in the city of Brockton. I uh, did pretty well on basically all those elections. I mean, just this past election, I was the top vote-getter as a city councillor in the city. But as you said, uh, last year uh, I became the council president. Uh, and within uh, six months of doing that, uh, the mayor passes on, you know, passes away unexpectedly. Uh, so there was a call for somebody to step up and basically continue the, uh, the, uh, the programs and some of the uh, uh, you know, duties and obligations that Carpenter had left. And I was honored to do that. I was honored to get elected by my peers in the city council to, uh, to take on the, uh, the duties of the mayor in this city. And I chose not to run for mayor. You know, I felt that it was important not to look or sound a little opportunistic in the sense. Uh, and also, there were other people who were running for office, so it didn't make much sense for me to come out of nowhere all of a sudden to toss my, uh, my hat in there uh, to run for mayor because I was, not, I was running for re-election as a city council uh, member, so that's what I chose to do. But, I, but it gave me an opportunity from a, from a different lens in the sense to go back. I mean, I had an idea what the, uh, the executive branch of the city actually did uh, working with Harrington, but as now the signal caller, you know, for the administration, it gave me a different perspective to look at and see things from a different lens, in a sense. And well, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go, no, and that's the reason why uh, having all of that and seeing those things coming and going from both ends of what comes into the city, what goes out from the city, that's actually what prompted me to, to basically seek uh, this next level in terms of running for state senate. Which leads me to my next question. So, <coughs> the decision to run for state senate, what separates you from Mike Brady? Well, a lot. Uh, I think um, you look at the, uh, at the level of education, for instance. Um, I have a college degree, and I don't believe he has one. You know, I've served in the military. 
he has not served in the military. I have a family, and the reason why I bring that up is because uh, you can sympathize and empathize with families that are struggling through. I come from a bilingual home where, where English was not spoken for, for quite some time, or even it's still nowadays spoken as a second language in this community, which is basically ex uh, exemplifies uh, a lot of the homes here in the city of Brockton. I happen to be someone of color. Uh, knowing the struggles of people of color in this community, and he's not. I've been fighting basically for equality my entire adult life, whereas I think he has lived a life of privilege in a way, uh, given some of the, the happenings in the past with his own life. So that, what, 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 that's what makes us a little, a little different. You know, I, I know what struggles are. I know what the reality of uh, or some of the issues that we're facing in the community are. And I think that's what make, makes us uh, completely different. And, and I'm also someone who's basically led a city um, for, you know, be it May for six months, but it's still leading a city for six months, uh, something that he hasn't done. I want to touch upon some, some issues. I'm, you know, we don't have much time, but I want to try to hit on some, <coughs> on some of them. Police reform bill. That's been a big thing the last few weeks. Um, it's now currently in the House. It got, um, got passed by the Senate, now it's back in the House. Um, Talk about how do you feel about the police reform bill, um, qualified immunity, and some things that you agree with um, the senator about, or some things that you vote that you vote against. Look, I've always been uh, someone who has called for police accountability. I think one of the things that we don't have in this country is uniform police accountability. I, I used this example the other day when I was on a, um, on a another a debate that we actually had, and one of the examples that I used is that when I was in the Navy, I went to boot camp in Orlando, Florida. I have friends who went to boot camp in San, in San Diego, and I have friends who went to boot camp at Great Lakes in, uh, in you know, around Chicago. Mm -hmm. But the training that we got was exactly the same no matter where you went for training. That's something that this country needs. We need to have uniform police training so everybody's trained the same way, so everybody understands, because we have one constitution. If we have one constitution, we should all follow the trainings associated with that Constitution. Yeah, the states might have their own constitutions, but the U.S. Constitution trumps all the other constitutions. You know, so we don't have uniformality in terms of police training. That's something that we need and need it the worst way. Because I'm also one of these believers that you can pass as many laws as you want to pass, you know, reforms, acts, or whatever you want to call it, but if you don't hold people accountable for their actions, you can have laws up the yin yang. We do have laws in the book that basically says what happened to George Floyd in Minneapolis is illegal. You can't kill somebody. The law says you shall not take somebody else's life. So you don't need a law that tells you don't kill them. What you need to is to know that, by the way, you do that, there are consequences for your actions. Is there a problem with policing? Is it a police problem culture? Or is it one or two bad officers? It, what, 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 what's the issue here? Well, let me tell you something. I, I can't speak for Minneapolis or Boston or Miami or some of these other cities in America, but I can speak for Brockton. And knowing the, the officers that we have in the police department, I'll bet you 99.9% .9 of the police officers in the city are great police officers. And, I, and I'd be willing to stick my neck out for them. Yeah, there's probably one or two or so that shouldn't be in the police department, just like we have uh, bad apples in all the businesses that you deal with, you know, but the difference is that when once those bad apples start acting out Then we need to deal with those bad apples because otherwise it's gonna it's gonna ruin the entire crop in a sense And I think that's what the issue is, you know It's to come up with a system in, in place that actually feed, you know that fills you know Basically kind of cleans out some of the bad bad actors within the police department and have a way of kind of, of keeping those bad apples out of jumping from Brockton to Stoughton, from Stoughton to uh, Whitman, from Whitman to the Bridgewaters. You know, if you're a bad, af a bad actor, you should not be a police officer because your job is to protect and serve, and you need to do that. Uh, how do you feel about qualified immunity? Explain what is that and <clears throat> how would you vote on that? Well, let me put it to you this way. I worked at Brockton Hospital for 12 years, and uh, doctors got sued when they screwed up, as well as the hospital. So I believe there's some, there should be some level of liability for police officers when they step you know, out of line in a way that has nothing to do. I mean, the example that somebody used with me the other day, it, they said something, a police officer goes out to arrest a young lady for whatever reason, and then he decides to rape her. 
they have protections that you can sue them civilly for their action. Yeah, that's wrong. That is wrong. You need to know that, by the way, you need to toll a certain line because if you don't, you will be liable for some sort of uh, retribution coming back in a way that hurts your pocketbook. Because it seems that the only thing in this country that we're afraid of is being sued. But I also want to protect officers that if they're driving to a, a call and they get into an accident and somebody dies in the process, whatever the deal might be, that they're protected from getting sued as well because it's still within the duties of their obligations in a sense. So we got to have a balance between the two. I'm not saying that what exists in terms of, you know, you cannot sue them versus sue the hell out of them. It can't be that way. There's got to be something in between that looks at it and says, go through the court process. You found guilty of a particular actions that you committed above and beyond the call of duty as a police officer. Then you should, you should basically answer the paper for your court. Most the big thing that I'm always hearing you say is, um, I mean, a lot of candidates say is bring in the bacon, bring in the, in the bacon. I do that all the you time, know. dude. Yeah, I, I can tell. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Not that I, are you making fun of my bacon? I am, I okay. am. Um, but bring in revenue to the state. So uh, what are some ways, some new ways that you think you can bring revenue to the state or some ways you can enhance that are going on right now to bring more money, I'm sorry, bring more money into the city? To the city. Well, that's, that is the chief reason for my running for office. The chief reason. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, if the current occupier of the seat was doing that, I wouldn't be running. But I can tell you that it's not happening. In this city, it's not happening. It, it hasn't happened while I was in the city council, and it hasn't happened while I was mayor. On the contrary, we have lost some programs because the current use, uh, occupier of the seat didn't follow through to bring those funds into the community. You look at, I use uh, Montigny from, for instance, from New Bedford on a regular basis. You see that Senator, last year he brought $1.2 million to New Bedford in appropriations. And this is where it differs. I mean, uh, the current Senator talks about, you know, voting for this act, voting for that act, the Student Opportunity Act, some of these acts, some of these acts, or the, uh, the CARES Act and all these other acts that are bringing funds into the community, but those are not his doing. My grandson could have voted for the Student Opportunity Act. You've got 40 senators in the, uh, in the state legislature, but guess what? The vast majority of them are Democrats. What is your one little vote to vote for something versus not voting for it? So the fact that you voted for something, first of all, it was not your idea. You are not the inscriber of that law. You know, you're not the prescriber of the law. You're not the main supporter of the law. So basically all you did is vote for an act that brought some funding into the community. And to be honest with you, where is the CARE Act, uh, the Student Opportunity Act in the city? Where is it? We haven't seen it yet. If anything, the city of Brockton should be given a lot more credit for going after the state and demanding that they put together uh, some funding to benefit the community because the, the funding that we normally get was not the proper funding that we should be getting as a community. So we filed a lawsuit against the state. The city of Brockton did, not the Senate, not the Senator. The city of Brockton did. We in the city council, or I as a mayor, continue that whole process to bring the funding at the level that it should be because the, form, the, 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 the funding that we get both from Chapter 90 and Chapter 70 funds those are formula funds. That ha has nothing to do with my ability to bring funds in or not bringing funds in because those are funds that are done. You've got X number of students times this formula gives you this lump sum. At so the what, what would be some of your ideas to bring in some money into the city? It's to advocate for appropriations of funds to benefit some of these community-based organizations that we have in the city. I mean, everybody talks about violence and gun violence and gun this and gun that. But how much resources are we spending at the, for instance, at the Cape Verdean Association to do programming to help Cape Verdeans uh, stay away from the gun issues or the Haitian groups or the, uh, the Hispanic groups or some of the general population in the sense to create the Y. I mean, what are we actually giving the YMCA and the Boys and Girls Club in terms of you know, putting together programs that helps keep kids out of trouble? What are we doing with that? The answer right now is nothing. And that's what frustrates the daylights out of some of us, because when we hear about, oh, I'm all over the place, I go to these meetings, and I see these people, I, you know what, 
I'm frankly tired of hearing people saying, I went to a funeral. You know what I want to do? I want to prevent funerals from happening. You know, I want to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to put together some, um, some resources, give some resources to those community-based organizations so that they're able to prevent the funerals, prevent seniors from going through the trouble that they're going through, or at the same time prevent, I mean, you, you look right across from this building, what's going on across the street with all the homeless people. What is the state doing for that? When was the last time that a lump sum of money came to the city of Brockton to deal with the homeless populations that are not just Brockton pro problem? You know, it's an issue for Brockton, but it's not a Brockton problem. It's a, it's a regional problem because you go out there right now and you talk to the people that you see out there, some of them come from Situate, Duxbury, Marshfield, some of these other, Rockland, Abington, all over the area because this is what the services are. But it becomes a Brockton issue. But where's the state to basically say, I'm going to come in and provide you with some fundings to help you with that issue? Where's the state doing and knowing that the opioid problems that we have in our community. Where's the state basically coming down? And don't give me the chump changes that we normally get. You know, chump change. You got some of the other, you look at some of the other communities, the number of dollars that they get in terms of resources into this community. What we're getting is chump change. Let me ask you a question. I know um, this is on the city council side, but what would you do as a state senator? You were, um, a few weeks ago, you were talking about marijuana and having an open, transparent process. Obviously, the state passed it a couple of years ago. On a state level, what could, what could you do to open up the process more for more minorities can get opportunity to, um, to sell uh, marijuana legally? Well, Nubi, you know, you know for a fact that um, when I first became mayor, one of the reasons why I wanted to go into the mayor's office to, is to open up that process to give some minority businesses in this city an opportunity to compete for, minority, uh, for the marijuana business because the previous administra administration, the Carpenter administration, had basically given out 11 community host agreements, but none of them were minority Brocktonians. There, were, there was one minority uh, woman from Canton, but not from Brockton. So I felt that that was uh, not really a just way to conduct business, especially when you're looking at a city that's a minority majority city, and yet not a single applicant was given an opportunity to compete. So I opened that process up, and from opening that process up, five host agreements were given out to people of color in this community. And I'm happy to, uh, to announce or inform that one of the young ladies that actually got that, Vanessa, just went through the process and got her license to operate uh, from the city. You know, But had I not gone into the mayor's office and opened that process up or spoke up about it, she would have never had an opportunity to do it because she was kept completely out of it. Because if you don't, know, if you don't have a host agreement, you can't get a license. You know, so that's what happens, for instance, when people that look and sound like us are not involved in the process, in the decision making, our people get left behind. And that continues to be a problem in this city, in this state. I mean, when you, I mean let's be honest. You look at the entire uh, Senate arm of the state legislator, legislative. Um, I believe there's two minority individuals up there. There's a Hispanic woman and a Vietnamese. There's no black, African American, you name it. There's not a single one. I mean, we talk about how progressive this state is or how diversified this state is, but look around and see what the diversity has actually brought. You know, you've got groups that have never supported a minority candidate in the city, in the state. You know, you got all these, you got all these, you know, these powerful unions that are calling for diversification, equality, and some of these other things. But when it comes to supporting candidates, they have never supported a minority candidate. You know? And guess what? They'll continue to sell the same old song and dance, and we keep buying it because we think that they're sticking up for us, but are, are they really sticking up for us? Or they're kind of sticking up for us? Let's talk about something else. Um, this was a couple of years ago, and, and some people want to bring it back. Unfortunately, Brockton uh, got denied this with the casino. Um, you, I know <coughs> something you're in support of a couple of years ago. Are you still in support of? And is it something you try to you know, revisit if you get to the, to the Senate? Well, uh, I want to make sure that we're clear about this. I'm not necessarily a supporter of a casino. What I'm a supporter of is a resort, uh, a, resort a destination. Uh, because 
If you create a destination in the city of Brockton, it brings jobs, it brings a place that we can go and have dinner, shows, etc., etc. Yeah, there's probably a little gambling on the side as well that goes on. But I'm not, you know, if it's a casino only, I'm against it. If it's a resort and a destination, I'm for it. Because I see it as jobs and resources to the community. And for those reasons, I would support it. Yeah, I think um, speaking from a, a 31 year old single male, you know, having something to do on a Friday night is, is, is definitely, it's huge, it's important. So. Well, you know what, just before COVID, in February, for my wife's birthday, I went to Foxwood. We spent the weekend there, you know? I didn't go to Foxwood to go gamble. We went for food, for the shows, for, you know, for shopping, you know, for, you know, whatever else you do, as well as maybe spending $100 on the, uh, on the slot machines for, you know, for some fun. But that's not the reason why I went to Foxwood. I went there to have uh, a good time and celebrate my wife's birthday. And that's what I think we're lacking in this community, a city of this magnitude, of this size. You know, we don't have a single, we don't have a movie theater, for crying out loud. We don't have a place where you can go and watch a show. I mean, look what happens at Brockton High when they do the, uh, the, the musicals. You know, the place is packed with people, uh, people from everywhere, they come. But they come once a year for that kind of stuff. You know, we need to get something that's a little more regular, a little more city-like. You know, often I've said, uh, I've coined a new a, a new uh, name for our region. It's called the uh, the Brockton, I mean the uh, Massachusetts Purgatory, because we're the forgotten group down here. You know, we're in limbo. You know, the state does, you know, for Worcester, for Springfield, for Lowell, for New Bedford. What are we getting down here? You know, what what are we getting out here? All we can do is raise taxes to make to make to uh, to make ends meet, and we can't continue to do that. Um, what are you most proud of? You know, looking back at your career, um, looking back within the council or with Mary Harrington or, you know, when you're in the mayor, what are you most proud of? I'm proud of the fact that, you know, here I am, someone who came to this country at age 16, uh, speaking absolutely no English, uh, going straight to Brockton High School and be able to uh, basically compete on a, on a, at the, an educational level, um, to have actually come back to this community getting married, having three beautiful children, and now two grandkids, uh, and also being able to, to come back and serve my city at a level that I'm in right now. That's what makes me somewhat proud of the fact that I was able to come back into our community. You know what? I could choose to live anyplace else. You know, and I don't mean in the region. I'm talking about outside of this region, like many people do. But I decided to, to, to live in this city, to build a home in this city, you know, we, I built a, a fairly new house back in 2007 in the city where many people were actually, you know, packing up and moving out of the city. But I chose to build a home here, you know, not intending to run for Senate or mayor or whatever, or even before I ran for city council, because it's somebody, it's a, a someone that somehow feels that I got so much from this city, I felt an obligation to give something back to this community. A little less than five minutes left. Uh, last question. How do you go about making a decision? Do you talk to your constituents? Do you pray about it? Do you meditate about it? How do you go about making a, a big decision that's maybe controversial? I think it's a combination of both. Um, I usually don't go by uh, the wind like some people do. You know, they'll stick their, their finger out and see which, way, which direction the wind is blowing. You got to be realistic in talking to people on a, on, a, on a real level. For instance, the issue with the water bill, you know, the, the raising the water rates in the city. Uh, you got to look at it this way. We've got a problem with old pipes. We got pipes bursting on a regular basis. You've got some places up on the north side of the city that have absolutely no water pressure. We've got old pipes coming from, uh, from Silver Lake that needs replacing. They're 100 years old. So you look at it this way and say, this isn't a popular move because nobody wants to raise anything. But the idea is that you need to do something about this. The state isn't helping you. The federal government isn't helping you. You got to help each other. I mean, you have to help. You have to have a conversation with the taxpayers in the community, the right, the rate right players in the community, your own family in some instances, your your friends, and you explain your reasoning behind this. Your reasoning behind this. Some moves are going to be popular. Some others aren't going to be so popular. But you got to do what you think is the best thing for the community because as we get these pipes done, the roads will get fixed up. So we're getting a. a, a a double whammy in the sense in terms of fixing old pipes, 
fixing the sewer and also fixing some roads. So it was something that in my opinion, listen, I'm a taxpayer and a ratepayer in this community. I don't want to pay anymore because I work for a living. I mean, the difference between, again, uh, the senator and I is the fact that I go to work every day for a living. You know, I can't say I'll meet you at 10 o'clock because 10 o'clock I have to be in Braintree at my job, you know, earning a living to support my family. You know, I'm not a, although I'm an elected official in this community, city councils are not full-time positions, you know. We have two, in, in my case, I think I have three jobs, you know, one through the Archdiocese of Boston, one through the Cape Verdean Association, and as a city council as well. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta go and you try to make whatever time you can make it for, the, for your community because as a working man, I have to continue to work and I work 40 hours a week so sometimes it's a little difficult to be where you need to be, unlike some of the other individuals. We're, we're coming short on time. How much time? We've got a few minutes. Um, look at that camera, make a, final, make a final pitch on why should people um, vote you in on September 1st. Well, Noob, first of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity. But at the same time, um, I want to remind folks that um, the, the perfect definition of insanity is doing the same exact thing, hoping for different results. We have done exact the same thing for the last few years, re-electing individuals to positions that we know for a fact that person is not providing the language or, or, or even the necessities that we have in this community. I feel that I can do a lot better because I've seen both sides of the fence. I've seen what comes into this community. I see what we spend out going into this community, going out of this community, and I've realized that not much has, has been done, at least since my tenure. And, you know, and, and doing the same exact things and, and expecting different results isn't going to fly anymore. We can do a lot better because some of the other communities are doing so much better. And we're still trailing everybody else out. We've got the problems that come along with having this humongous city in the middle of a bunch of little towns that we can do so much better, but it's by voting in the right person that this thing is going to change because you know what we've got a technically a lame duck senator who was basically stripped of, of some authorities in the uh, in the senate and by re-voting that person back in there nothing is going to change it's going to go back to the same old thing so again let's give um, an opportunity to those that actually have done something to prove their point and that's what i'm counting on on September 1st for folks to give me their vote of confidence and a vote on September 1st. Moses, wish you the best on September 1st. Don't forget to vote, guys. If you, if you don't vote, don't complain. Go out and vote um, and, and definitely make your voice be heard. That's it for the conversation. We'll be back with more candidates after this. Hey.